Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you again today. Welcome to Worship and the Word with us here at Church of the True Vine. I pray that God will bless you as we spend this time together today. I'm going to turn straight to the Word of God. I'm reading this morning Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. O my soul, you have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My goodness is nothing apart from you. As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied who hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer nor take up their names on my lips. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Isn't it good to know that because the Lord is at our right hand, we shall not be moved. You know, we don't have to bow down to the things of this world. We don't have to go running after the things of this world. We simply place our trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has provided salvation for us through the cross, the one who has promised to never leave us, to never forsake us. Because the Lord is at my right hand, I shall not be be moved. You know, for so many Christians around the world at the moment, they need to know the Lord at their right hand. And I've heard so many uh, stories and testimonies of people who face severe persecution, who have said they have never felt the presence of the Lord so strongly as when they have been in prison, even when they've been being tortured, they have known the presence of the Lord. And that has not only sustained them, they have known a joy and a peace in the middle of everything that they face. Because the Lord is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Today we are praying for Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. Every week we pray for a different nation where Christians are being persecuted. And, and uh, today we're praying for Christians in the nation of Mozambique. Let me read to you from the World Watch List booklet uh, what it says about what is happening in Mozambique at the moment. Islamic extremism is on the increase in Mozambique, particularly in the north of the country, where so-called Islamic state-affiliated extremists use violence to spread their influence and control. Attacks by Islamic militants have killed many believers. Churches have been burned and ten thousands of people displaced. Christians who manage to escape the violence often lose their livelihoods and possessions. Abduction and forced marriages are also common, and a woman who's converted from Islam may be forcibly married to a Muslim. Please, please join with us as we pray for our brothers and sisters in Mozambique today. And please join with us as we continue to pray regarding this appalling war in Ukraine. We are praying that peace will come, that there can be reconciliation, there can be a restoration of that nation. So please join with us. But now let's turn our attention to praising this God, this God who when he is at our right hand, we cannot be shaken. We're going to sing a great song this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord. May God bless you today as we worship him together. Bless be your name. 
Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming to you in prayer to worship and thank you for what you have done and are doing and will continue to do for all eternity for us as your children. Above all, we thank you that while we were far from you because of our sins, you sent your only Son into the world to live and to die and shed his precious blood so that we can be cleansed and forgiven and have the joy of having a relationship with you. We do praise and magnify your holy name. We thank you for the freedom that we have to meet together in your name. But our thoughts and prayers go out to the millions of our brothers and sisters in the faith who do not have this opportunity. Especially today, we pray for the Christians in Mozambique who are constantly under fear of attacks by the Islamic extremists. We know that many believers have been killed, churches burned, and many displaced and lost their livelihoods. We thank you for the work of Open Doors Partners who support the work there through emergency aid, persecution survival training and economic empowerment projects. Please, Lord, meet their needs, both materially with food and other essentials, but above all spiritually to help them to stand strong in the storm of persecution. May many folk in Mozambique, through the love and witness of believers there, turn to you and come out of the darkness of Islam into the light of the good news of Jesus. Lord, we continue to pray to you, the Prince of Peace, that peace will come to the war-torn country of Ukraine, where there has been so much suffering. Remove those who try to prolong the suffering and give wisdom to those who are seeking to bring it to an end. We pray for King Charles and the royal family, that you will strengthen and sustain him in his first year of office and make the other family members a good example to the nation. We pray for our government, that you will give them wisdom at this time to make the right decisions about all the issues that they have to face, the threat of strikes in so many walks of life, soaring fuel costs and poverty for many, the astounding rise in the number of migrants coming into this country. All these issues seem unsolvable to man, but we pray to our Almighty God that you would step in and have your way and guide and influence the affairs of this government, even though so few acknowledge you as sovereign. We pray for the Church, your body here on earth. Lord, open the ears to hear what you are saying to the nations and our eyes to see what you're calling us to do. May the gospel message be fearlessly proclaimed in our land, and may everyone have the opportunity to hear it. Raise up a new generation of believers who will impact the entire life of this nation. Lord, forgive our sin, heal our land. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The message today is taken from Daniel chapter 3. This is one of the best known accounts in the Bible. I can pretty much guarantee if you ever went to Sunday school or if somebody gave you a, a book as a child of stories from the Bible, you could pretty much guarantee that you will have come across this account. This is the story of the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who are thrown into the fiery furnace because they refuse to obey the king's command. It's quite a long chapter, which is why we haven't had a, a smaller reading from it. And so I'm going to go through certain parts of it just to bring out what I feel the Lord is speaking into our hearts today and what God wants us to take from this today as we study this passage. Nebuchadnezzar, this is verse one of Daniel chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width six cubits. 
Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. The children of Israel have been taken into exile in Babylon because as a nation they have rebelled against God. They have not followed his ways. They have not followed his commandments. They have served other gods. They have run after the ways of the nations around them. And so as God uh, warned them through the prophets but they refused to listen. God had warned them but because they refused to listen, they have now been taken into exile in the kingdom of Babylon. And the king, Nebuchadnezzar, ruler of this mighty, mighty Babylonian empire, sets up an image of gold whose height is 60 cubits. That's around about 90 to 100 feet tall. This thing is huge. 100 foot tall with six cubits what's that that's about another 10 foot wide so this is a, an enormous thing that the king has set up and he has he has declared that everybody in the kingdom has to bow down to this image and worship this image now just to give you a little bit of background before we go any further shadrach meshach and abednego along with daniel are among the, uh, the, the, the young learned men who have been brought from Israel, from the land of Judah, into exile to serve in the king's palace. But right from the word go, they have refused to simply bow down to the ways of Babylon. It tells us in chapter 1 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego come, uh, they, they come in with Daniel on this. And they said, we are not going to eat the meat, the delicacies that the king has served up to us. Can we just eat vegetables? There's a reason why they were doing this. It wasn't just a, a, a dietary uh, thing. You know, they hadn't just decided to go vegan or whatever. This was because the meat and the wine, this was all involved in pagan worship. The, that meat would have been from meat sacrificed to idols. And in Exodus chapter 20, in the Ten Commandments, God is very, very clear in his instructions to the Jewish nation. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. God makes it very, very clear that the Jews were to limit their worship to him and to him only. This was the whole reason why Judah was in exile in Babylon in the first place, because they had turned to other gods and followed them. And so Daniel and these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, have made it clear right from the word go that they are not simply going to walk according to the ways of the empire in which they now find themselves. They're not just going to go the way that everybody else is going. They're not going to bow down to other gods. These are men of integrity. These are men whose trust is in the Lord. And then what happens is another challenge comes. And this challenge comes because King Nebuchadnezzar has now set up this golden image, 90 foot tall. And he has declared that everybody in the kingdom has to bow down to this image. And so 99.9% of the population, probably more than that, there were millions of people living in this empire come to the plain where the image has been set up and they bow down as they, as they hear the command. When the music plays, they bow down to this image. But you see, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, and we can presume Daniel, make a stand. And so many people need to understand this is something that is so important for the church at this time. We need to be those who will not bow down to the ways of this world. You know, it's so easy just to go the way everybody else goes because, well, everybody's doing it. 
But listen, just because everybody is doing it does not make it right. In Nazi Germany, there were people who went along with the Nazi regime because it was safer for them to do it. Because everybody else was doing it and they didn't want to stand out. There were many people who were not actively Nazis and yet by their refusal to make a stand against it, they became complicit in the the horrors of Nazi Germany. There were those who stood. We think of Bonhoeffer and Niemöller and their professing church who made a stand. And many of those who made a stand died in concentration camps. It's important that we make a stand against what is wrong. It's important that we are separate from the world in our attitudes, in our beliefs, in what we consider to be right. It's no good going along with things just because everybody else is doing so. Just because everybody else is doing it does not make it right. Just because there is fornication in society does not make it right in God's eyes that we should just go along with it. Just because everybody fiddles on their taxes doesn't mean that we should do that. Just because everybody takes a bit of cash in hand instead of declaring it. Well, that doesn't make it right. We need to be people of integrity. We need to be people who are sold out to our God and will not bow down to the ways of the world, no matter how convenient it might be for us. We've been praying today for people around the world in Mozambique and around the world who are persecuted for their faith. They are persecuted because they refuse to bow down to the gods of other uh, of the nations in which they live. They refuse to bow down. They have said we will follow Jesus and Jesus only. And as a result, they are persecuted for their faith. But this is what is so key about this tale of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. In verse 16, the king threatens them with the fiery furnace. He says, listen, if you refuse to bow, if you continue to refuse to bow down, you know what is going to happen to you. Bow down. Make it easy for yourself. Come on, go easy on yourself. Just just bow down. It's not really going to affect you very much. You can carry on worshipping your own God after that. But for now, just just bow down. Then I won't have to throw you into the fire. And these three men of integrity and character and godliness say to him, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king but if not let it be known to you O king that we do not serve your gods nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up that needs to be the response of the church to everything in society that is against the word of god that needs to be the response of the church to the legislation that permits sin to run riot in our lands that needs to be the response of the church to anything that would cause us to bow down to any system any ideology that would stand against the word of god they said we know that our god can deliver us but even if he doesn't we will not bow down to your golden image, O King. Men of great integrity, men of great courage. And so Nebuchadnezzar is filled with fury and his face changes towards Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and he commands that the furnace is heated up seven times worse than it normally is, seven times hotter than normal. This furnace is so hot that the soldiers who are told to throw them into the fire actually die themselves from the heat of the furnace. And it tells us here that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego fall down bound into the midst of the burning fiery flames. But then, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. Look, he answered. I see four men loose 
walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Isn't this wonderful? The king saw them not just walking in the midst. He saw them loose. Let me tell you something. Obedience to God will bring you freedom. You walk free even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of appalling circumstances. You can walk unbound and free. The king bound them. The king said, you're not going to bow down to my image. You're going to be bound. You're going to be thrown into the fire. There is no escape for you. But in the fire. In the fire, we see that they are walking loose, not bound by the chain, but not bound by the ropes anymore that they have been bound with. They are walking free. Let me tell you, obedience to God brings you the truest freedom that there can possibly be. Free from the oppression of men, free from lies, free from the condemnation that comes through sin, free from that guilt that would come from turning to other gods. You walk free. If you will stand for God, if you will follow God, you will find true freedom. Jesus said they will know me, the truth, and the truth will set them free. We see Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego walking in the midst of this trial, unbound, even though they have been bound to throw them into the furnace. They are walking in the midst of the fire, unhurt, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. This is what is so wonderful here. We're really getting to the nitty gritty now. The fourth, the one who is with them, is like the son of God. You know, when you pass through trials, when you pass through tribulations for the name of Jesus, you can guarantee one thing, that Jesus will be with you. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 43, God gives Israel, this promise. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were pressured Precious in my sight, you have been honoured and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. What a promise from the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. But I want you to notice that God not only says, I will be with you when you pass through the waters. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Psalm 23, such a well-known psalm, but Psalm 23 and verse 4 David, who wrote this psalm, makes this wonderful, wonderful declaration. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Not though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you will be with me. No, David says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. This is a wonderful truth if we can only get hold of it. You see, it's not just in the trials that God comes to be with us. Jesus made a wonderful promise to the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the promise of God that he is with you always. 
God didn't suddenly appear with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. As they followed him, as they trusted him, as they refused to bow down to other gods, as they placed their trust in him in their daily life, the Lord was with them. But it was in the trial that the world saw that he was with them. It was in the trial when the king looked in to that fiery furnace that he saw the fourth man walking with them. It was in the trial that God was made manifest. But he was always with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. We can guarantee that Jesus is with us. Jesus came that we might be reconciled to God. And Jesus bore our separation from God that was caused by sin. Second Corinthians chapter 5 21 tells us that God made him who had no sin to be made sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be made sin for us. And as Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus in that moment knew what it was to be separated from God, his father, from God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus in that moment knew what it was to bear the separation from God that our sin caused. It was impossible for us to be with God because of our sin. And yet Jesus in that moment on the cross cried out, why have you forsaken me? Bearing our sin, bearing the separation that sin caused so that we need never be separated from God again. We can be reconciled to God. We can know God again. We can receive eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this is is eternal life that they may know you that is God the Father and the one whom you have sent to never be separated from God again if you will turn away from the things of this world if you will turn away from following other gods if you will turn away from other ideologies that are that are opposed to God if you will turn away from your own way if you will turn away from your alienation toward God, then you can know the presence of Jesus with you always. One of the amazing things that we constantly hear from those who are persecuted is that in the midst of the persecution, they know the presence of God more than they have ever known it before. But God has always, always been with them. It is simply that in that time of trial, it's not that God shows up, it's that God reveals his presence. You can know the presence of God with you at all times. You can know his love, you can know his peace, you can know his joy, you can know his strength. You can know the joy of walking in the forgiveness that he gives because you are no more separated from him if you believe in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is this, to know you and the one that you have sent. Jesus came that we can be reconciled to the Father. It's very easy. If you believe in your heart, the Bible says, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Do you believe today that God raised Jesus from the dead after he died for your sin and my sin? Do you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? If you do, then the Bible just says you have to do one thing more. And that is if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. To confess Jesus as Lord doesn't just mean saying Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord like a parrot until you think you've done it. To confess Jesus is Lord means you say I surrender my life to you, Jesus. I ask you to be Lord of my life. I will not allow anyone or anything else to be the Lord of my life. I turn from other gods. I turn away from false ideologies. I turn away from everything that is opposed to the God who made heaven and earth. I turn away from them and I ask you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. If you believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead and 
you will surrender your life and ask Jesus to be your Lord, then the Bible promises that you will know that salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. It's only Jesus who died for you. It's only Jesus who is risen from the dead and is therefore able, because he lives forever, to save to the uttermost anyone who will call upon him. So call on the name of Jesus today. If you haven't done it already, I just want to help you. Praying this prayer is not going to save you in itself. This is just to enable you to express what is in your heart as you turn to Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that although I am what the Bible calls a sinner, you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I confess, Lord, that I have sinned. I have followed my own way. I have followed other gods. I have followed ideologies, opinions that are against you. I have turned like a sheep to my own way. I have forsaken you. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you died on the cross for me, that you bore my sin. You were made sin for me. You died the death that my sin deserved. And yet on the third day, Jesus, I thank you. You rose from the dead and that you are alive today and you will save all who call upon you. Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for my alienation from you. It was caused by me, not by you. Lord, I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me. Please, Jesus, wash me clean through your precious blood, which you shed for me. I will follow you, Lord Jesus, with all my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength, as best as I can for the rest of my days. I ask you to be my Lord, and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit to enable me to follow you as you deserve to be followed. I surrender my life to you, Jesus. I am yours. Thank you for saving even me. If you've prayed that prayer, then Jesus will have heard it. If you really meant it, Jesus will have heard it and he will have saved you in that moment if you believe it in your heart. And as you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, he will have saved you. If you have prayed that prayer, then please get in touch. We would love to hear from you and to help you, to pray with you, to encourage you as you follow Jesus Christ. So please get in touch. If you're anywhere in the Clevedon area, we meet at Prince's Road at the Community Centre at 1030 on every Sunday morning. If you're not in Clevedon or the surrounding area, then please get in touch anyway. We would love to hear from you. And of course, we will be back again on YouTube at the same time next week. That's 10 a.m. UK time. So until next week, may God bless you. May God keep you. May God give you peace. May God give you joy. And may you know his goodness and his mercy all the days of your life, according to his word. Until next week, God bless you. Bye-bye.